we have a very special episode for you today. We are going to reach into the past and talk about Richard D. Wyckoff and Jesse Livermore and the, the relationship that the two of them had back in the early 20th century. And to do that, we have a very special guest, Stella Asoba. Stella, welcome to the program. Thank you. Stella is going to take us on a journey through the early 20th century where she is going to talk about Jesse Livermore, the incredible speculator, and Richard D. Wyckoff. And so we are going to get started. I am going to get out of the way and let Stella uh, present this material to us. Stella is our official Wyckoff biographer. So she is um, an incredible resource for uh, us Wyckoffians. Stella is an attorney, a writer, an independent trader who graduated from the University of Warwick in England. She is admitted to the Bar of England and Wales, as well as the State Bars of California and New York. Uh, Ms. Asoba left the legal field to pursue her trading and writing career. She has gained the Chartered Market Technician's de designation. She coaches individual traders and investors and develops courses in technical analysis, trading, and self development. Stella has written an, an incredible series of articles on Richard D. Wyckoff and his personal life. And those can be seen at stocksandcommodities.com. And she has also recently written this article on uh, Mr. Wyckoff and Mr. Livermore. And with that, Stella, let's get started. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Bruce, for inviting me. I'm excited to give this talk today. And as um, Bruce said, this um, talk is based on an article that um, I wrote and was published in the October 2019 edition of Technical Analysis of Stocks and Commodities magazine. Stella, uh, let's just pause for a second and we'll turn the screen over to you. Stella, we can see your screen. Go right ahead. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, so the title of this talk is Wyckoff and Livermore, The Conversations. Um, Wyckoff met um, Jesse Livermore for the first time in about 1917 in a hotel in Florida called the Hotel Breakers, which I believe is still, is still around today. Wyckoff was always looking for um, information on how to read the mind of Wall Street, on how to trade. And um, it's notable that in those days, even though he interacted with um, most of the bankers and industrialists, he um, often said that, especially in, in relation to James Keane, that they would not tell him how they trade, traded. It took about four years of Wyckoff interacting with Jesse Livermore for Livermore to invite him into his trading room and to actually start to tell him um, of his trading methods. And so this talk today is just a distillation of some of the points um, that some of the topics um, of trading that um, Livermore discussed with um, um, Wyckoff. So, um, there are 10 topics that I have taken from the book and the book that eventually be, that um, Wyckoff published, um, which were a compilation of articles that he had published in 1922 on his um, discussions on trading with Jesse Livermore. Um, give me one second. The book, the book was called, hang on. Um, Livermore's Methods of Trading in Stocks, and that was published in 1939. And so let us start. The first um, topic is, and I'll briefly go through all of these because most of these uh, are, are well known. Um, people may not realize the origin, but most of the topics here are, 
uh, really well known. Day trading, for instance, one of the things that I've come across is that a lot of people who may have heard of J um, Jesse Livermore automatically think of him as a day trader and nothing could be further from the truth. Now he started off in the bucket shops and um, trading in the bucket shops, which were just like facsimiles of um, actual trading houses because they were, you did not actually buy or sell stocks. All you did was bet on the direction of a stock. And he became known as the boy plunger because he became so successful at doing that. But they were really more like gambling um, outfits. And he, as he matured as a trader, he actually moved into um, um, the brokerage houses and actually started trading real stocks. And when, once there, he, um, he started focusing on the intermediate and on the long term. Wyckoff notes that he cured himself of jumping into and out of the market um, day after day. Before I go on, I just want to mention something that I found. A lot of people who are new to trading are attracted to the idea of day trading. In fact, I recently came across a course by um, somebody who was advertising for a couple of um, thousand dollars, of course, which would teach a novice how to day trade to make extra money for holidays, um, you know, and, and, and other things. And I thought nothing could be further from the truth that somebody would be able to take money out of the market day after day nothing could be harder um, than that and basically that's the exact same thing that Wyckoff and Livermore said in order it's one of the more difficult ways of maintaining consistent profits um, trading the longer swings are what Livermore did and basically the Wyckoff method teaches you how to do that Cheap stocks. This was one of the things that um, Wy Livermore noted to Wyckoff as being one of the mistakes that the more experienced traders make. Looking for stocks um, that are inexpensive with the idea behind that, that if you buy more, you stand to make more profits. But he noted that price is often not an indication of cheapness. And I took a current example of um, two stocks. Um, and as any technician will tell, this is under armor and it's closed at 1588. Any technician looking at this stock, you know, it, it's gapped down a couple of times, it's making lower lows, we'll see that this is this stock is in a downtrend. Um, even though it's basically, it's, it is a cheap stock. A healthier stock would be this one of regeneration, which is, it spent the last five months or so forming a base. It recently broke out of that base, but it closed at 341. Now, which stock would be the better one to buy? The cheap one at 15, or the more expensive one at um, 341, which has formed a long base. And um, Livermore noted that often this analysis is lost on novice, novice tra traders. And so it's one of the things um, to bear in mind. Now, as I said, Livermore had cured himself of um, jumping in, in and out of, of stocks. He actually looked for turning points. And he made um, the comment that this was one of the most important things that he did. Judging the main turning points in the long swings is the most important thing that he does. And if he could accomplish nothing else in between the panics and booms and accurately judge the right time for, the change, for changing his position, he knows that he has a starting point for the piling up of tremendous profits during the intervening year or two when the market is on its way from the dare to zenith. And so um, in order to be able to do this, um, Wyckoff notes a couple of things which we'll go on, which we'll talk about later. One of the things is patience, is being able to not just accurately judge when um, a stock is turning, but to be able to wait for the right moment to enter the trade and to be able to hold on to the trade while it is um, acting right. And he made a note, he, 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 he talks about a stock acting right a lot. And one of the things um, I will note, and I've had problems with this as well, is when a stock is acting right, is having the discipline and the patience to be in the position and to hold the position, even though the position is profitable. Studies have shown that we feel the pain of a loss twice as much as the, um, as the pleasure of a gain. So 
we often will cut our losses short. I mean, cut our gains short. So when a position, when a stock is acting right, we, 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 we are quick to jump out. But when it's acting wrong, when we're losing money, we will hold on to the position in the hopes that it will turn around and make us right again. And so one of the things is, um, is, is understanding that the psychology that has not changed, nothing has changed. It was as true then as it is now. Um, the next point he brings up is the danger point. And, and this is something that Wyckoff talks about in his trading course, his trading method. And I think he gets this from um, Livermore because Livermore mentions that he um, gets into a trade as close to the danger, danger point as possible. And so what exactly is the danger point? The danger point is that for a trader who is using technical signals, the danger point is the point at which the signal has been given according to technical principles and confirmation, um, confirmation says that it's time to enter the trade. So once we see, once we've planned the trade, we understand what our, what our um, entry signal should be and the confirmation should be, we enter. And what we will find is that the danger point is that point underneath um, the signal where the trade should, should not go. The reason why it is so essential to enter as close to the danger point as possible is then we can actually um, successfully um, cut our losses short. So if the trade were to reverse, we know that um, you know, we know that the trade trade is not acting right and we can get out before losing too much money. Oftentimes we will look for more um, confirmation and allow the trade to move um, a considerable distance from our danger point. And that, 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 that moves us away and allows, um, allows us to increase our chances of um, getting losses that are um, unsustainable. So one of those principles, a lot of trading is to do with discipline and patience. And we see these themes again and again coming out through um, Livermore's um, talks. So um, when we talk about danger points, if we get in at the right time, then we can put our stops at the right place. We can limit our losses. And so um, the discipline and um, patience that is required for successful um, trading is our skills and um, habits that are learned. And it takes a considerable amount of time to acquire the, uh, the necessary skill and um, the necessary skill and discipline. He says in terms of um, time stops, um, Livermore mentioned that he would often be wary of stocks that drifted around aimlessly. So stocks that um, that are, are trendless, you know, you, you give them um, a period of time and then you get out of the trade, even though it, you're not sure if it's going to rise or fall. The opportunity cost of staying in a trade that is not working, that is just drifting around, was too, was too much for him to deal with. So he would get out of a trade, um, give himself a time stop and get out of a trade when that was hit. Um, in terms of price stops, um, you know, um, stocks that did not move in a desired direction, for instance, stocks that hit your um, danger point and then um, proceeded lower or, or the reverse, depending on which way you were going. Um, those were stocks, those, those were, he, he, one of the things was Livermore traded huge positions. So he would not use, um, he would use mental stops, not actually um, stops that you could see, but he would use mental stops because, because um, to protect his positions from people from gunning for his stops. So he would use mental stops, but he would always use stops in his um, trading. One of the things that I noticed in um, Wyckoff's course is that he, say, he says, um, look for stocks that move the fastest, the soonest, and the furthest. And this, I believe he gets from Livermore because that was what Livermore was looking for. He wanted, he, he cautioned um, Wy um, um, Wyckoff to trade the strongest stocks. And then he also said, he looks for stocks that are volatile, stocks that are likely to move from 10 to 30 points and in the, in the intermediate term or 100 points in the longer term. But he wanted that movement, he wanted that volatility. So that's what he looked for. 
So there are stocks that we look at um, today and, you know, they don't show, they don't show any, um, you know, they, they, they may be low priced and they don't show any ability to actually move more than a few, a few points. And one of the things that should disqualify a, truck, a stock if you're trading it is how far is it likely to move in the time frame that you're willing to trade it. So one of the things um, I notice about Liv both Livermore and, um, and Wyckoff is the amount of time they spend on the psychology of the trader. So it wasn't so much about the skill of, or about reading the charts or about um, understanding fundamentals, understanding technicals. It was more about understanding yourself. And the wife of said, um, Livermore says, in the long run, patience counts more than any other quality except knowledge. Trading is not difficult, except in um, it, its execution. So studying it and understanding the principles underlying technical analysis or even fundamental analysis are uh, easily learned. But having the, the, having the trading um, temperament is what is difficult. And one of the things that um, comes up again and again is the discipline needed to maintain um, success. So um, one of the things Wyckoff said, so few people trade, so few people succeed in the market because they lack, they, they lack patience. And you see these things coming out again and again, again, and again in um, Wyckoff's work and also in Livermore's work. You know, it's um, the ability to hold on to a trade, the ability to wait for the right, just for the exact right uh, moment to enter a trade. Um, most people look at trading as some um, get rich quick um, schemes and they're constantly looking for a strategy or a system that will allow them to get um, profits quickly because that is what is advertised. But trading is a game for the long run. Tra trading takes patience. Trading is boring. Trading requires immense amounts of discipline. And those are some of the qualities that come out again and again in, um, in, in the work that um, Livermore does. The next thing he talks about is poise. And this is one of the, this, this one I found um, even more interesting than normal because what is poise? And it doesn't require, it doesn't refer to a physical, um, um, even though I have a yoga, uh, a, somebody um, doing a yoga pose um, in the image. But what it really refers to is um, mental clarity. It's um, a state of mental balance, which en enables him to, re to regard any situation calmly and from an unbiased point of view, uninfluenced by hopes and fears. And this becomes very significant when you think about this um, fact that one of the things about perception is that what was commonly believed to be true is not true. Um, our minds are not like recorders. We don't see all that is out there. What we see is to, is, um, is to a significant degree formed by um, what's going on in our minds. So um, there are many studies that have recently been, that have been done, and they show that brains do not passively record the input um, that it receives. Um, from the eyes to, pro to provide a visual representation of our environment. Um, there's something called expectancy-induced illus illus illusory precepts. And what those are basically is that our moods can cause us to see things that are not there. And there's an experiment um, that I recently came across where people were given stimuli, different stimuli, and they were asked to look at um, images of smiley faces and frowning, just sad faces, basically. And the smiley and sad faces were in the same proportion, but the stimuli different, um, differed. So people were given um, happy music to listen to and then given the stimuli, and um, given the images to look at, and they reported seeing more smiley faces than sad faces. But the people who were given the sad um, images and um, the sad music to listen to reported seeing more sad faces 
then smiley faces. And basically what that, what, what that, um, how that helps us in our trading is the fact that when we look at charts, it's often we have to be conscious of the fact that we may, we, our mood influences what we see, can influence what we see. And um, sometimes, you know, we see, we will not see what is actually there. So the, the, the skill is to try to bring our perception as close to what is real as, as possible. And the way we do that is by damping down our moods, being very conscious of how we feel and trying to neutralize our moods so that we can increase um, our perception. The next one I want to talk about is silence and seclusion. One of the things um, Livermore um, told Wyckoff was that your, ex, your, your neighbor, your friend, somebody always wants to tell you their opinion of the market or ask you for their opinion or ask you for your opinion. And he wants to insulate himself from the opinion of others. And it's interesting that he said that because even when he became a really successful um, speculator, he still found that listening to the opinion of others, whether it was on the, in, whether it was in the media and the papers or whether it was um, a friend, a neighbor, whatever, seeped into his psyche and influenced his, um, his trading. So he tried as much as he could to insulate himself. I believe he lived somewhere in Long Island and he would not take the train because he did not want to run into people. So he would um, commute into the city, into Manhattan um, each day when he was in New York um, by private car so that he could separate himself from others. He told Wyckoff that he played a lone game. You know, his game was his and he's alone. It was he, he would focus, he would concentrate and he would um, block out as much as he could the opinions of, of, of people, of anyone, including the, the so-called experts. And this is one thing that I find to be very insidious. Um, it's funny, you look at any of the media and you see people are bullish and bearish, you know, somebody always has a strong opinion of what is likely to happen, but nobody has a crystal ball. So one of the skills of a successful trader is to cultivate that ability to trust yourself and to insulate yourself as much as possible from the opinions of others. And on losses and profits, um, this is one of the more salient um, aspects of trading because we trade with them um, capital accounts um, and sometimes um, you know the money that we used to trade comes from you know hard end work so we want to grow the money we don't want to lose it but one of the things about trading is um, you cannot avoid losses so a little more caution that you must not trade to avoid lo lo losses because losses are in inevitable and then Wyckoff says um, use the losses um, as the cost of doing business. So just as commissions and taxes are the cost of doing business, losses are also part of that inevitable cost. The job of the successful speculator is not to avoid losses, but to learn how to manage them emotionally and financially. And one of the things that pulls us back as traders is that fear of losses. You know, you get into a trade, maybe you're early, you get out of that trade, and then the, another signal comes up, and then you hesitate before you go back in, and then find out that, um, you know, you would have been right, you were right, the trade, the trade works, and then you get in early, you get in late because you don't want to miss out completely, and then find out that it reacts, and then you lose, and then it happens all over again, and you find that you're, you're booking losses instead of, um, you know, making profits. So I'm going to end um, by just making a few points um, that Livermore and... Um, Wyckoff also, uh, also made. One of the things they said, and it appears in Wyckoff's writing as well as Livermore's, is Livermore said, tell your readers, Livermore said to Wyckoff, tell your readers that in order to become a suc successful speculator, you must give to trading the same amount of time that you would give to a profession like law or medicine. And this is really true. I have a picture here of um, Simone Bile. And, um, you know, basically traders are, are not born, they become great by years of careful practice spent cultivating their tax. Too often um, newcomers to trading 
you know, want immediate evidence of their success, of their mastery. But it is a craft, it is a skill, it takes time. Um, and my, I'll end with um, words from Wyckoff on evolving a trading character. He felt that trading character, um, paper trading lacks the element of risk, so try to trade with um, real money. And that goes back to um, Livermore saying, you know, um, about losses. Um, learning to kill your losses, learning to realize that losses are inevitable, and learning to understand how to manage losses. Um, the obstacles to be overcome are the feeling of uncertainty of um, in danger, the hope of profit as well as the fear of loss. So if you can go into your trades um, feeling as neutral as possible, taking a neutral position as possible, and this is not impossible, this is something that you learn. And as Wyckoff says, you know, you make, if you, after you've made hundreds of trades, you may then find that you can work without hope or fear, but you have to first subject yourself to all of the emotions that accompany regular trades. And um, so basically that's, I, ho I hope that has been useful, but those are some of the points that I wanted to bring out um, in the conversations between these two great traders. And wow, Stella, there was so much in there. I think this will be a video that people will watch over and over and over because there's so much content. And what I was going to, I was thinking about as you were speaking is that reminiscences of a stock operator, which was written by Edwin Lefebvre and was a book that we required students to read in our class was allegedly written by and about uh, Jesse Livermore, who was the fictitious character, Larry Livingston, in, in the book. And I read that book every year. And it's a wonderfully written story. But it really is a coming of age story for becoming a mature speculator. Yes. And, and it's, it's one of the best um, books on trading that's been written. Oh, every great trader will have it at the top of their list. Yes. And, uh, and so the, the essential elements in that book temperament, maturity, discipline, and so on. And all of the mistakes that the young Livermore made uh, are just so valuable to read about. Um, anyway, uh, Stella, uh, we really hope that you will come back again and again and again onto power charting and that we can have uh, more of these presentations and just your dis uh, discussions about uh, the um, uh, the great speculative Richard D. Wyckoff, Jesse Livermore, and um, and have them uh, be uh, further uh, source of further discussion. I'd love to come back. I hope I, I hope you find it useful. It's the time the time flew by. Well, you're wonderful. Thank you for being here, Stella, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you. If you're interested in trading Alexander Elder's Come Into My Trading Room or Trading for a Living book, uh, we have the settings on stock charts to do that. First of all, the Elder Candle style. Then you could use Keltner bands to set up the width. These are adjusted based on the ATR and the force index, of course, as well as his MACD or the regular MACD. So here's how you do that. You'd select Elder Impulse System from the drop down menu on chart type. You'd select Keltner channels and pick the width that you want, and it has to be one that fits nicely. And then Force Index and MACD. And again, the way you pick the Keltner channel width is you want it to just touch the top of most of the, the primary uptrend bar so you get out just at the right time. Anyway, enjoy trading for a living.